You are listening to Preconceived, where we examine the preconceptions that shape how we view the world and the paradigms by which we live our lives. Hey everybody, I'm Zale Mednick and welcome to another episode of Preconceived. Today we're going to be talking about fairy tales. When we think of fairy tales, most of us probably think of the Disney films that tell their stories. But many of these stories existed long before Walt Disney transformed them into films. Fairy tales are not new. They've been told, albeit in various forms, for many centuries. So how has the fairy tale evolved over the years, both in terms of purpose and content? How did Disney's new take on the fairy tale transform the genre? And what have been the positive impacts, but perhaps also negative ramifications that have resulted? I'm joined today by Professor Jack Sipes, the leading world expert on fairy tales. Jack is a professor of German and comparative literature at the University of Minnesota. Among his many awards are a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship and the International Brothers Grimm Award. So I'm really excited for you to listen to this chat I had with Jack about some really cool insights about fairy tales and what we probably didn't know as kids. Enjoy. Jack, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's my my pleasure, uh, especially in these difficult times. It's great to speak to another human being (laughs) (laughs) agreed yeah i think podcasts have been part of the reason i've said i've stayed a little more sane just because i get to chat with uh, new Uh, people this way this is a really fun topic i i I feel like i say that a lot but this one is this one's a really fun one and i know you agree because you've spent so much of your career devoted to it right right well i hope hope you're not a uh, a robot so I want to start off with a bit of the evolution of the fairy tale. As I alluded to there, our modern Western conception of fairy tales isn't what a fairy tale always was. Fairy tales go back centuries, perhaps millennia. So what is the timeline of the evolution from the oral tradition of a fairy tale? How did that originate? Well, like all forms of art, the fairy tale, what we call a fairy tale, originated when people began talking to one another and living with one another and helping one another so that they the species would survive so the oral tradition is extremely important because everything starts with that tradition with people getting together at the end of a day or sometimes during the day when they didn't have televisions or radios or whatnot or computers they got together and they told stories of various kinds depending on the society in which they live now as the species itself began to evolve and the intelligence of human beings enabled people to write down a lot of these stories the uh, different types of genres began developing in the fields or in the huts or in the mansions or in the castles and so on and so forth. And these tales were meant to to enable people to deal with the conditions under which they were living. And depending on your class, whether you were a slave or whether you were a half slave, half (laughs) assistant, apprentice, apprentice or something like that your the stories vary and quite often people called upon uh, the powers unknown to them who might explain why they were on the earth and what their what their mission was to do on the earth so that's how various religions originated and because people invented gods different different types of gods and with the gods came stories that were made up, imaginative stories, that were made up about these gods or power, powerful forces. And in the case of the what we call the fairy tale today, they, they, and there was always a little magic in them because of the f- fact that people felt, did not understand the natural forces uh, that surrounded them. Uh, and so a lot of transformations or things that occurred seemed very magical. Seemed like, wow, (laughs) we've got to talk, we've got to report about that. We've got to talk about anything that- that, Like a flash of lightning. uh, Right, a flash, any, anything that, that, uh, a a weird uh, monstrous animal or some 
human being who uh, lived in a cave and then came out of the, the any you name it, or a a a princess who rebels against her father and runs away in the disguised as a as a donkey. So there there are all these tales circulating. None of them, most of them, at the beginning had some sort of religious basis, like we know the Greco-Roman gods, the Egyptian great Egyptian tales and so on around the same period. And these tales were, for the most part, not written down, okay? I mean, a, a fair amount were written down, so we have a good sense of, of what people were concerned with in, in this Greco-Roman period. But as uh, technology, and we always have to uh, bear that in mind, as technology developed and as a human being's brains also became more acute with regard to understanding how forces, natural forces could be tamed and used to better, to make life uh, more easy, more pleasurable. Well, when, the, when all of this was going on, people began thinking, well, we, to communicate with one another or people who, for, who are far away, let's invent writing. <laughs> let's begin writing down the messages. And, and so with writing, with the technology of writing, comes the publication or interest in various groups to public, publicize particular stories that they found enlightening, informative, fun, whatever. And so in the early period of Christianity, we see a move away from the Greco-Roman gods because Christianity asserts itself. And at the same time that all of this is going about, more and more people begin writing tales that are somewhat critical of Christianity, somewhat critical of the authoritarian powers of different kings, queens, princes, princesses, and so on. And so in the early period, uh, particularly in Italy, there are two writers who represent a move toward the educated middle, middle classes. Their names are Gianfranco Straparola and Giambattista Basile. And one wrote in the 15th century and the other 16th century. And they wrote amazing, they, they, these are tales they, they had learned from the peasants, learned from all types of people, but they were basically tales of the people, tales of the folk. And, and, but, and so it was a very limited group of people in the world, and, and we'll talk about the Western world right now, we'll focus on that. There were very few people who could read, and, and most of the times the priests, would take advantage of the fact that most people couldn't read and they would generally not only take their money and food, but they would tell rollicking stories, sometimes in Latin, which nobody understood, or sometimes in the native, the indig indigenous language. Now, as people, be, uh, as more and more people became educated, became more literate. Their desire to read, in, and they generally read in groups. Not, they did not read the way we read. They, somebody would either uh, take a book, write a, a manuscript or, or a book that was published when, public, when technology began developing publishing houses. They would sit down uh, uh, in a parlor or they would form little groups, societies, and they would get together every Thursday or Friday or things like that. So the reading was always important with regard to fairy tales because people really enjoyed them and, and you could vent, you could vent all, you, all you wanted by by having these metaphorical stories in which kings and queens were terrible and miserable. And, and this is, of course, but you couldn't put your finger on the writer and say, you're going to be arrested and put in jail because uh, the writer would say, well, I didn't mean you. I met some other king or queen or things like that. So we have to realize that a lot of what we call folk and fairy tales today were political, politically critical of what was happening, who had power, and why they had power and so on. 
including critiques of the sorcerers or, or, or priests and so on and so forth. So when we get the big breakthrough uh, in terms of the folk tale and fairy tale, everybody in, in Europe, anybody who was educated, knew about Basile and Saparola and many other Italian, very good Italian writers from the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. But moving into the 17th century, toward the end of it, in King Louis XIV's court, the, there were about 12 or more female writers who were superb. Uh, and the leading one was a woman called Madame Dolnois, Catherine Dolnois. And she is the first one who, when one of her two, a two-volume book, two-volume collection of tales were published, she called them contes de fées. And she was the first one who, who, who used the term uh, tale of fairies. They, in, in, all, the, uh, in all of the tales by, that were called contes de fées, the power returns to, to fairies. The fairies replace the Greek gods. And so these fairies are extremely powerful just in this brief period in France, but it had, it had a tremendous effect on opera, ballet, and other uh, kinds of art in the 17th and 18th centuries. And eventually this movement after the, the Napoleon went until the Napoleonic Wars, this movement moved to Germany. And so you get the German romantics who began, began it, 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 there's a lot of appropriation of tales. So you never can tell, you know, where for sure a particular fairy tale came from, from the oral source. So that's the rise at this time is in Germany followed by England or the United Kingdom. But I think what I'd like to emphasize right now is that the middle classes are coming to power. You know, the, we, we're getting rev revolutions, numerous types of states are being formed, principalities are being done away with. So it's a, a period, the 19th century is a long period of what I would say new evolution with regard to societies, networks that were being built, with regard to communication and art. And it was a period when also Karl Marx and, the, the, and, and Lenin, not Lenin, I'm sorry, mixing angles, became very important in terms of socialism. Socialism and anarchism begins developing in the latter part of the 19th century with new technologies, trains, electricity, and so on and so forth. So it's a new ball game. Nevertheless, all of these magical tales are still highly significant in, and have become sort of cl classical in a certain sense or almost essential because most of the best tales, which, which we have kept with us, speak to unresolved problems among human beings that are so essential to our, our survival, we tend to remember them in our brain as memes. Now, so if you look now going back at all the tales that people have told, there are billions and trillions of tales, not all of them stick in our brains as memes, but some do, like, if we take Little Red Riding Hood, and I've written a book a long time ago about the trials and tribulations of Little Red Riding Hood, but I use Little Red Riding Hood now as an example of why we, we see Little Red Riding Hood almost everywhere, on television, internet, plays, jokes, advertisements, you name it. Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf, of course, a man, werewolf, originally werewolf. This is a tale about rape. It's a tale about the violation of a young girl by a man, by a wolf, by a beastly uh, man. And it's a tale that sticks with, and, and there are, again, probably hundreds of thousands of variations, adaptations of this one tale. It doesn't always stick in our brain exactly as the way the Grimm's and Perot, and they're very different 
you know, in the tale that Perot wrote, she's killed and that's it. It ends, it ends little, little girls who invite wolves into their parlors deserve what they get. Wow. <laughs> and the Grimms, yeah, that's how it, the, the French version of Perot in 1697, that's how it ends. <laughs> and how did Grimms adjust that? Pardon? And then how did the Grimms adjust? Oh, oh the Grimms end with, with a hunter coming by because a girl can't save save herself. So, uh, the wolf has already eaten grandma and and the and uh, Little Red Riding Hood and he's sleeping on a bed, generally speaking, and has a big tummy. And as a hunter comes by, he hears some snoring. He goes into the, into the hut or cabin and sees the wolf there, takes a knife, rips open his tummy with a knife, and out pops grandma, out pops Little Red Riding Hood, and the hunter says, go and get some rocks and put them in his tummy. And so they, they do this. In the meantime, the wolf is asleep and the rocks are poured in. The grandma uh, sews up the tummy. And, and then when the wolf wakens, he goes outside and his tummy is so heavy that he falls down into a well and dies. And that's how, that's how the Grimm's and, and there's another ending, another type of ending, appendix that they attach to their ending as well. The one that I love the most is about a little girl. Her name is not named Little Red Riding Hood. She's just a, you know, a young peasant, about 10, 11, 12 or so. And her mother says, uh, go to grandma like you always do and bring her this wine. So she goes off on her way and she meets a werewolf. Not, not a wolf, a werewolf. And the werewolf says, where are you going? And she tells him, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and he, he departs and gets there first, eats up the grand, eats the grandmother, takes some of her blood, pours it into a bottle, and puts some of her flesh into a bowl, uh, jumps into bed, and waits for, little red, for, for the girl to arrive. The girl arrives and notices that there's something strange going on here and just as she's putting something down on the table there's a bird or a cat that says a whore is she who who wants to spend time with a werewolf and so she's alerted by what is going on and the wolf then the werewolf says why don't you sit down at the table my dear she and he's in the bed and the and he says why don't you have some of the meat that's in the bowl and have some of the wine. And again, when she does eat the flesh of her grandmother, and, and this ritual is interesting, and drinks the wine, again, the bird or cat says, again, you're a whore if you do this. And now the werewolf says, why don't you take off your clothes, my dear, and get into bed? And she does that. And she, but she does a strip tease. She takes off her blouse and says, what should I do with this granny? And he, and he says, throw it into the fire, my dear. You won't be needing it. So with every article of clothing, she throws and gets into bed nude. And then there are the famous three questions. And with the final question, which is always what big teeth you have, the girl at this point says, oh, granny, granny, no, I can't. I've got to go. And then the werewolf says, well, do it in bed, my, my dear. No, Granny, I've got to go caca. And he says, oh, okay, go outside through the window. And he ties a rope around her ankle. And she goes through the window and goes over to a peach tree or pear tree and ties the, unties herself, unties the rope around the tree and starts running off toward home. And in the meantime, the, the uh, werewolf is sitting there and sitting there. And then finally he says, uh, what are you doing out there? What are you doing? Are you making a load? And he runs to the window and realizes that he's been tricked. And he jumps through the window and trails, runs after, but never succeeds in, cap in, in, in capturing her. Well, it's fascinating because... When you say Red Riding Hood, and then you initially talk about how this originated as a story about rape, that's not what most people 
I think. Right. Thinking about right. when you hear Red Riding Hood, it's kind of been watered down a lot of these stories where that social commentary, yeah. yes, of course there's social commentary that we're aware of and in the fairy tales we know of in their current forms, but that social commentary has been diluted compared to what you're describing. <laughs> where up to the point where very few people would have known that that story was a commentary about rape. Right. There was a big wave, titanic wave, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, feminism. And it, it brought out some of the best versions of Little Red Riding Hood by, and by feminists. And they recognized it right away. I, in, I may have influenced some of the writers, but for the most part, you know, the, the women discovered from other writers or just realized that the milk they were giving through this watered down story to their children was poisonous. In other words, these sweet Disney-like versions really covered up what was deep down crucial for the continued existence of this tale. Why does this tale exist? It exists because in most people's minds, little girls really want to be raped. That they, in other words, is an ideology, a patriarchal ideology that this tale covers up in its sort of general shape. That, and in, like I said, at the end of the Perot tale, little girls who invite wolves into their parlors deserve what they get. And in fact, most men think that. You wanted it. You know, the girl who, who goes off and drinks at a party, is having a great old time and is a little loose and some guy thinks, you know, she wants it or I want, I, that's typical in, in, in all countries and in some countries worse than others. I mean, that's an apparent, that's a definite, that's a definitely apt topic in these times when there's a lot of attention, rightfully so, being brought to that topic of sexual assault, uh, yes. where that is a really false misconception about how rape and sexual violence occurs. Exactly, exactly. So, so is it a the greatest false assumption about fairy tales is that they were written for children, which is stupid, totally stupid and wrong because these tales emanated from an oral tradition in which children heard the tales. They were in the, you know, most peasants lived in one big hut. And so they, they with their animals and, or if they didn't, if they were from the middle classes, they would, you know, gather around to, together and somebody might tell this particular tale and they'll hear it. But these tales that we call fairy tales were not spoken for children or spoken uh, or written down for children. That comes in the 19th century, in the latter part of the 19th century. Yes, the, the whole development, which is a commodity, a sort of a commodification of art, the whole development for what we call children's literature that never existed really until the 19th century and, and still didn't exist for the majority of the, of the population until the beginning of the 20th century. These tales were tales for adults. The, and, and some of, maybe, you know, some of, the sing, some of the songs or melodies or that we sing for children to get them to go to sleep or little charming tales, they have nothing to do with fairy tales. So when things begin to change, and I know there's a lot of history in between to the, it, there's a lot of history that we're not discussing up until the point where Disney comes along and really transforms yes. things. Yes. When Disney comes along and he transforms the fairy tale and I think it's fair to say waters it down and changes the yes. tone more directed. That's, that's better. That's much better. Is that ultimately is that a good thing? I, I mean, I can think of many negative things about it, but I can also think maybe maybe it's positive that there's not a story like Red Riding Hood, which is suggesting that rape is a woman's fault. Well, you, you know, there, there are, Disney and his crew in the 1930s, they, they also did some very short films of about 15 minutes long, and they did play around, and there was a lot of sexual suggestion and they like Tex Avery was a, a, another great 
uh, animator uh, of the 19th, much better than Disney, by the way. That's because he probably was too raucous <laughs> and too, let us say, outspoken and political in, in different ways. In fact, the, it, you know, the, in the 1930s, I think it was 1934, films that showed too much sex or violence were, ban were banned. There was a code. That was, I forget, it was, I think it was 1934, I forget what it was. And so they had to clean up, even Disney, had, they had to clean up their films. And so it's not totally their fault, you know, that they sweetened and the, their films, their animated films and so on. But our society, or some people in our society, wanted these films to be more, let's say, uh, pedantic, a, a, a little more moralistic and things like that. Whereas Tex Avery films, if you watch them, you, you go before, we were talking before the code, and you'll say, oh my God, these are brilliant. And they were, they are, if you, if you can get a hold of them. And you can. <laughs> was, was, was Disney's goal when he started transforming these stories, was it, this is going to be better commercially, or was it from a genuine place of, let's come up with these more positive stories that could be endearing to kids and perhaps inspire them uh, to yeah. believe in this higher dream. Sim similar in many ways to the still reflecting society, but the American dream that mm -hmm. maybe was developing at the same time. Uh, so the, all of these films from the very beginning, Disney wanted to make money. He wanted to, he was a smart man and really he came from a, sort of a lower middle class family and for him to succeed in animation with his with his brother was very very significant and he had some hard times in the 1920s but he was basically was not really addressing even then and he had a roar that's the period when he was mickey mouse had not developed yet but it was at the in 1929 or 30, beginning the 1930s when he starts developing Mickey Mouse, but he was doing all these adaptations in the beginning of the 1930s of fairy tales, a lot of fairy tales. And you, when you watch them, they, they're actually fairly artful. He's, he always had a really good eye for choosing animated, you know, artists who, who would draw, and not only artists, but music, musicians, musicians, and so on. So Disney was always like most people who come from lower class families, really want to better themselves through money. You need money in America in a capitalist system. Otherwise, and you need to have power. You need power. And he, he learned that lesson when some of his early films were stolen, were plagiarized by somebody else or distributed by someone else. And so Disney became a really, with his brother, I'm forgetting his brother's first name, but they became really aware of, of these uh, sort of wolves in, in L.A. and on the coasts. Disney came from Chicago, from the Illinois area. And so, yeah, he, he I would say, was fiercely uh, protective of anything he did from the 1930s on because of, of that traumatic, having a really some interesting films stolen from him or plagiarized. So what happens to Disney is that he, he really needs a blockbuster film in order to establish his name even more so than it was at the beginning of the 1930s. And, and that was in the planning of Snow White. That went into the planning Snow White was intended to be a good film, but he had to watch out and not make it too much sex or violence. And that was the film that that really brought him fame. And from that point on, you've described that as the first definitive, the first definitive animated fairy tale film. Yes, it definitely is, and and it's a film sort of based on on a lot of theories about the theater that you, the well made play. So. Uh, Disney's up today, and um, part of the success of the corporation today is the films are always going to be well made, and you're always going to get the same story time and time again. 
there's not one single story, including Frozen, which was a big hit. That is different from Snow White, really. It's the same story. How so? It's a story about elitism. It's a story about, about protecting the elitist, genuine, almost, one could say racist, it's a racist notion that the, the only the beautiful, wealthy, handsome, knowledgeable people should succeed in the world. And, and they should control the world. And that basically is the implied message, implied message, including, you know, the, like the, what's his, the lion. The, the lion uh, king. The lion king. I mean, it's a perfect example, but, but all the other fairy tale films as well. It's always the upper classes who triumph in the end and maintain their, let us say, their, their racial signs that really mock them as necessary for the world. It's interesting because when you say that, I think of some of these stories and I, I thought when you were, I thought you were going in the direction there of damsel in distress who's maybe from the lower class and it's a message on how the lower class can prevail. But when you think about it, at the end of these movies, Snow White marries a prince and she goes yes. and joins that higher society. Yes. Cinderella yes. marries a prince, joins that yes. society. Frozen, yes. which as you said, there's a variation yes. because there's not the male figure who's rescuing the female. The females are helping each other, but they are royalty still. So yes, of in course. Aladdin, Aladdin is a poor guy. So yes. the, the, message the message is, the message is we live, we live to make them famous. We work to make them famous and strong. And anything that we do that might upset the system, we will be jailed, humiliated, done away with, quieted, and so on and so forth. So the story that Disney's, it's Disney's story anyway, because Disney rises, you know, from the lower classes to become King Disney. But the message Disney. is that you can rise to be King Disney. The message is Aladdin can become royalty. I guess the message, which maybe, maybe I missed or many people have missed on some level, is that it's okay to be lower class. It's okay to be in that situation. But how many of these heroines and heroes are actually maintaining that lower status, status position by the end of the film? Right, right, right. You have to comply. You must comply with the system and behave in a certain way in order to be accepted and to really rise as far as you can go. If you don't do that, you're not going to rise. You're not going to participate in all the joys of the world. And you, you basically are going to stay in your measly lower class home and you watch TV and, and some other things that have been invented to distract us from what is important in the world. Another related feature of, of a lot of these stories is the happy ending. And most <laughs> Disney stories have happy endings. Yes. Is there a danger in Disney's focus on happy endings? Because I, I, I see potential, it's, I know there are, I see potential issues. One, that it can permeate into society and in many ways has like I alluded to in the American dream before, that people expect happy endings in their lives. As long as they work hard, they'll, they'll get those happy endings. And like you just said, they'll elevate their status. And then the other problem with the happy ending is that the stories all end at that happy ending, but they never focus on what happens after that, which is real. Life. That's it. You, you hit it. You, you, the, the, the happy ending is the beginning of the real problems. <laughs> as yeah. anyone who knows who has a relationship with somebody else or anybody who gets married and, and takes vows to be true and so on. That really the wedding or the happy ending is only the beginning, is really the beginning of a new film, should be the beginning of a new film because that's when the problems occur. How do we live together in societies where we are supposed to be faithful always to our mate when we know 60 or 70 percent of marriages break up or there's deception and things like that. The Disney Corporation actually in the 
fifties or no later on your fifties or sixties no sixties I think I started making uh, sequels <laughs> to some of the Disney films and they were they were the, I think the uh, Little Mermaid they made about two or three sequels to what happens afterwards. And it's quite hilarious to watch these these endings, which are filled with even more sweetness because of the fact that they really can't do a film that's very tragic or or complex and so on. That's a Di Disney sort of, I would say, the Disney ideology is to dumb down people so that they really can't think critically. If there's and, a huge and, oversimplification. Yes. Yeah. When you look at fairy tales now in Disney on a whole and the impact that it's had, we, we focus on the show a lot about preconceptions and a lot of our preconceptions are formed when we're so young, when we're watching movies like these, which are telling us certain stories about what love should be, what yes. it's supposed to be, what a happy ending should be. Right. How if you only dream big, then you will achieve whatever you want. Those right. preconceptions then become so indoctrinated into people. Do you think yeah. that Disney overall has had a positive impact on the story, on the fairy tale and people's lives? Or do you think that it's, it's done more damage in some ways? Oh, no, no, no doubt, M much more damage than we realize. People don't face up to it. People don't want to think about it. Disney has had the seal of good housekeeping. And so, and you never want to, with the theme parks and films of different kinds and so on and so forth. But ultimately, the, as I said before, the ideology of the Disney films is basically an elite ideology in, in which people are socialized uh, to believe in actually a types of behavior and thinking that really are used by corporations and companies, and I would even say universities, to prolong uh, a type of power structure that really uh, does not uh, allow for a great deal of autonomy and individual thinking. And so if you, if you develop stories that basically lead people not to think, and not to think for themselves, and not to really question authority, then you're going to get a society like ours today in which fascism is, is a real danger now. And there's no, I won't call Disney a fascist. Of course, a lot of people thought he was a type of authoritarian, let us say, controller of the, of the fiefdom that he built up. I think you've done a really amazing job, and I mean, you are the world's foremost expert on this, in explaining the evolution of the fairy tale, and especially where we're at now, and the status of Disney. One interesting thing that you said was related to Frozen, because a lot of people look at Frozen as Disney has really progressed, they've really changed their tune. <laughs> but perhaps it hasn't really, perhaps as you said, the story hasn't really changed since Snow White. Right. Where do you hope that the fairy tale goes after all your years studying this and after seeing it for several decades evolve? What do you hope is the future for fairy tales? And obviously Disney is a part of that. Well, I, I think that, you know, there are already great animators like uh, Miyazaki, the Japanese, a great director of an Japanese animated films, which are m much different, more complex, more, more frank about all types of social and familial problems that we have in the world. Uh, but he's, Miyazaki is not the only person. There's a, an entire group in Ireland. There, there are many other animators that we don't get to see. One, why don't we get to see them? Oh, might the Disney Corporation be blocking other animators from showing their works in America? Well, in fact, sadly, yes. So there, there are in every country now in the world where films are being produced, fascinating interpretations of all sorts of fairy tales. So I, I don't, it's, it's a question of time, of breakthrough. The people after a while are getting tired 
of, of these re repetitive films and theme parks and so on. So I think that I'm very hopeful that there are the young people who are making animated films are going to be much more inventive, much more serious about social problems, try to create audiences so that they will ponder, the audiences, the spectators will ponder their own lives, how their lives are related you know, to the particular films or plays or operas. In other words, there, and, and there are, this has always, this has been going on, but we don't know about it, okay? It's blocked. It, it doesn't, these films do not have, say, the distribution or, and, and other artworks don't have the distribution network that a company like Disney or other larger companies, Disney is not the only company that's blocking or making inane films. So I am hopeful. And, and I think that, you know, once the coronavirus ends, we might be very surprised because people have become amazingly inventive in terms of communicate, uh, communicating with one another since we can't go to major theaters. And there's a whole, whole uh, new industry, so to speak, that's being developed. And, and I don't mean in this corporate sense. I mean, a lot of talented people are, are using the media to make us think, to give us enjoyment, to give us hope, to allow us to celebrate and to be joyful. So yeah, I'm hopeful. Well, I think those are really positive words to end on. And it's been really enlightening chatting with you and seeing a side of fairy tales in Disney that a lot of us probably definitely overlooked when we were younger yeah. that had long lasting effects on us. But it's refreshing to get a different perspective from, from an expert like you and also hear some hope about the future. So thank you so, so much for taking this time with me. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been my pleasure. And okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.